And so we see that deaf blindness is really a disability about information gathering, and it really can limit the child's access to getting information about the people and the objects around them. And like they said in the video, it really sums it up very nicely that it's not just a hearing loss and a vision loss. It's really something together, all together different, which is um, exponentially more than just those two things combined. I'd like to uh, take a minute for us to think about the seven senses. Most of us usually think of there being five senses, the vision, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. And there really are two other very important senses, the vestibular sense, which is how we understand where our body is in space. And then the other is proprioception, is how we know where our body is in position to itself without taking it outside your body and looking at yourself. It's how you feel where your body parts are. And so all of these things work together to take in information around you in the world and to make sense of it. And so when we have vision and hearing that are impaired, we need to think about the rest of these senses and whether or not they're functioning well for the child or whether or not there may be some other impairments in those other senses so that we can really understand which sensory channels are working for um, the child and we know how to um, reach them and communicate with them. And so for typically developing children, 95% of all learning happens through those distant senses, and 80% of that happens through vision. And 90% of learning is incidental, meaning all of those natural learning opportunities that kids experience with their families and their teachers. And so we have to think about it a little bit differently. Here's a nice visual representation of typical learning for young children. You can see in the bottom part of the pyramid that this is the incidental learning, all those natural learning opportunities that happen usually mostly via vision and hearing that really they, they go on and we observe what's going on and we learn a lot of things just by participating in that. You'll see that the middle part of the pyramid is the secondary learning about listening to somebody teach you how to do something. And then the tiny part of the pyramid on the top is those direct hands-on learning experiences. And so for typically developing young children, all of this incidental learning is really where we focus our early intervention work in increasing natural learning opportunities and helping families understand the importance of that. However, for our children with deaf blindness, the pyramid of this model really is completely flipped. The incidental learning at the top of the pyramid is really a very tiny portion of the um, opportunities that child has for learning. The secondary is difficult. It, it might happen, um, but it's not, it's not very easy. And then the largest part of our children's learning is through direct hands-on experiences, which is this big part of this pyramid. So we have to think about how we teach our children with deaf blindness pretty differently than we do our um, typically developing young kids. And so these are some of the considerations um, of the learning needs of our young children with deaf blindness. They need hands-on experiences, active movement and exploration of their environment, predictable routines and schedules, making the best use of what residual hearing and vision they do have, having high expectations and trusting relationships with their caregivers, and lots and lots and lots and lots of communication about everything that's going on with them and around them. And we're going to look at some of these specific strategies in more detail in the rest of our presentation. But I wanted to explain some of, some of why, why we need to think about things differently for our kids with deaf blindness. One of the major considerations for their learning is anticipation about what's going to happen to me, who is with me, where am I going. So often our children with deaf blindness, like things happen to them or they're just picked up and taken somewhere without any 
any cueing about what's going to happen to them. And it just leads to this life of chaos where things are happening to them or around them. And it's really difficult for them to make sense of that without some pretty direct teaching. And the next consideration is motivation. Sometimes our young children with deaf blindness are kind of isolated in a little bubble. And often they kind of like their little bubble. It's kind of cozy and happy in their in their bubble. And it's up to us to invite them to explore with people and with um, objects in their environment. And one particular thing that I wanted to point out to you all about motivation as it relates to motor development is that it's often something that's just out of reach that will motivate a child to start crawling or to start walking. And so We have to also think about the impacts that the hearing and vision losses have on every area of the child's development. And the next is communication. We're going to talk actually quite a bit about communication, but it's more than just language development. It's really about interacting and socializing. And we have to think about communication in a multi-sensory modal fashion to be able to communicate with and to understand our children's communication that they're giving us. And then the last consideration that I wanted us to think about today is what we call confirmation. How does, how does the world work? What happens when I do this? What kind of reaction do I get? The cause and effect learning that goes on and how this relates to concept development. It's not something that's easily observed for our children with deaf blindness. So again, it's something that we have to teach very directly and explicitly. And I know that was a lot of content on that slide. I want to let you know that we are going to address a lot of these underlying issues in the strategies that Emma is going to share with us in the second part of our presentation. But I think it helps to have an understanding of not just how to do you know, strategies with children, but why are we doing those particular strategies. This is a simulation activity. So imagine that you know, you're at a park with a child and this is what you're observing there. And this slide here is for, you can imagine a child with no vision impairment is this is what he or she is looking at. So you're, you're there at the park and you can talk about the girl in the orange jacket and she's there with her mom and They have a dog there with the mom. They're feeding some geese. You could even count the geese. So you can imagine that you're having, you know, a pretty rich dialogue um, about what's going on there at the park and that this is a very natural learning opportunity for children. And this is what would the child would be seeing without any vision impairment. And this is to simulate what um, a child with 2200 vision would have. And that is the threshold for where the definition of legal blindness, just so you know. So the child is still seeing something here, but you can see that what you can talk about is starting to become more limited. You can see that there's maybe some people there and some animals you can't really tell the difference between the goose and the dog. So you can't really, you know, have too much conversation about that. You can still, you know, get some idea of what's going on, but you're not getting complete vision information here. Then the next filter is simulating 2400 vision, which again, the you know, the child with this kind of vision is still seeing something, but is not getting um, complete information. So you can, it's really hard to make out what's going on here. You can perhaps see that there's some people and maybe some animals in front of some water. And that's about all that you can really say about that picture. And now if you imagine that the child also has a hearing impairment on top of this, you can imagine how difficult it is then for the child to take in all of this information because the vision and the hearing are not going to be compensating for each other. For children who have only a vision impairment or only a hearing impairment, the one sense can often compensate for the other. But when you have a little bit of loss in both of those senses, it really makes it confusing and and it really can impede the child's concept development and learning around this kind of activity.